I'd like to welcome you today to our session, uh, Boosting Latin America's Infrastructure. And first, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, Georgina Baker is the International Finance Corporation's Vice President for Latin America and the Caribbean, and Europe and Central Asia, a small area of the world. Uh, and in this role, she is responsible for a committed uh, IFC portfolio of $22 billion. Uh, Joe Kaiser, President and Chief Executive Officer of Siemens Germany. Uh, and Joe has 30 years of experience at Siemens uh, with various leading management positions in business, finance, and strategy. Uh, Adolfo Spielmann, uh, Managing Director, Head of Latin America at CPB, CPP Investment Board of Canada. And Rodolfo is a member of the board's uh, Latin American um, Regional Investment Committee and leads all investment activities in LATAM. And uh, Mariana Luz, who is the, the head of the Embraer Foundation, um, not to be confused with the Embraer Aviation Company. Um, and she's also the head of sustainability, I think, at Embraer Aviation globally. Um, and I'm Joe Lay. I'm the Bureau Chief of the Financial Times here in Brazil. Uh, and I would like to say just how timely this session here today is, especially uh, with how long it took me to get to this conference this morning through the traffic. So I think uh, there's a few things that we need to solve here in Brazil. Um, and I've been in Brazil now for seven years, uh, and I can speak mainly of my experience here. Uh, and when I first arrived here, I studied Portuguese in Campinas. Um, and for anyone who knows Campinas, uh, it's a relatively small, very modern satellite city of Sao Paulo. And you can understand how this gave me a completely wrong impression about the infrastructure of, of Brazil. Uh, it's, it's got fantastic highways, it's got a beautiful airport. Um, so it's a bit of an exception. Um, overall, Brazil's infrastructure is actually uh, quite patchy. If you look at the uh, World Economic Forum's competitive rankings, Brazil ranks uh, slightly higher for infrastructure at 73rd uh, than its overall ranking, which is 80th. The, once you look down into the numbers, um, Brazil's infrastructure is saved a, a little bit by the high availability of flights and also its strong telephone services. For the quality of roads and ports, Brazil actually ranks um, uh, beyond 100. So it's actually, uh, and the railways, railroads are not that, uh, that much better. So with this, I'd like to put uh, our first question to our panelists. Um, how can a new project pipeline of high quality and resilient infrastructure be financed? And I can think of no one better to answer this question than you, Georgina. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so IFC is very proud to be working uh, for a very long time in, in Latin America and in Brazil. And we have a number of investments in the infrastructure space here. But, but what uh, we have been focusing on most recently is how to crowd in other, other people's money, namely the private sector, namely uh, institutional investors. And we have created a program that if I can talk about for a few minutes, um, where we have uh, brought in three very large insurance companies, Allianz, Prudential, and we're just about to sign finally with AXA. Um, they have given us uh, to lend on to our clients half a billion each, so that's one and a half billion in total, where they are following IFC's investments. We sat down with them at the beginning and discussed which sectors and which countries they did not want to, want to invest in. And once we had agreed on that, and that took a fair amount of time, but once we had agreed on where they did not want to go, they had to then follow us in every investment we did across our infrastructure book. And that was a big deal for very large insurance companies that know, insurance very, uh, know uh, infrastructure investment very well, but only in OECD markets. We are, we feel more knowledgeable about investments, uh, infrastructure investments in emerging markets, and this was an area that they were, were unfamiliar with. So very familiar with infrastructure, very large balance sheets, very nervous about investing in emerging markets. And we, when they invested alongside IFC, they, they were much more comfortable. And I can talk about it more, more uh, later on if you like, but it was, it's, it was, for me, the most exciting part of this is the demonstration effect. This is demonstrating that for large insurance companies from the West, uh, uh, Allianz and Prudential are in, are in Paris and Germany, and Prudential is from Asia. They can come with us to markets where they, they were very nervous, um, and they're following us. And once they've done it with us, they will do it on their own, and they will bring others behind them. And that, to me, is the most fundamental breakthrough that we've had, that these insurance companies, these institutional investors with very large balance sheets are beginning to look at emerging market infrastructure and realizing that they, too, can do that. I'll, I'll come back to that, because uh, I want to ask you why they were so nervous. But um, 
Joe, uh, this question, how can a new project finance of high quality and resilient infrastructure be financed? Oh, well, I believe that answer has already been given. The point is, to me, is a bit different, and I would take it on earlier. Um, what does it take to bring infrastructure investment to a country? And it takes, it needs a plan. And that plan needs to be set forth by the government. You know, how do I develop my country in infrastructure? What is my energy agenda? What is my mobility agenda? How do I effic efficiently transport people and goods? And then uh, the financing will come because there is so much money in the world and all those pension funds and insurance companies and, um, you know, uh, which just got mentioned, they are dying to invest. But there's got to be a plan for localization, for innovation, and then, you know, for economic development. And that's, I guess, been the, the challenge which Brazil has had in the last several years. They've been busy with other things. China has a plan. Now, we can debate about China as much as we want in terms of democracy or the lack thereof, but they have a plan. And they have been expanding their plan now from China to, to the whole Asian European continent with the One Belt, One Road, or Silk Road Initiative. Um, India has a plan. Reform plan was more put in place. There have been a few things which didn't go the way it should have gone, but for the most part, it works. Both have 7% GDP growth. So now the first half of the brick, to the tail end seems to work well. First half of the brick, the BR is, uh, needs to catch up. And that's why, you know, yesterday, as of yesterday, we, we went together with the government and signed an infrastructure MOU where we said, hey, let's make a plan together. How do you develop your country? How can OEMs help with localizing and make it more efficient? And once that plan is in place, people will come and invest. And, uh, and, and, and insurance companies will place money to work in infrastructure investment, because that's the best you can do, because it causes inflation, right? So it correlates with inflation, and that's what you want to have in your assets in the pension fund. So we need a plan for Brazil. And I truly do hope, and the conversations I had yesterday, day before yesterday with the president and some candidates which are up for the running, um, goes exactly in that direction. You know, get, your, get a government, let's go sit together with the ones who can help you, and then make a plan for energy and infrastructure, and then there is abundant money all across the world to flow into Brazil, and there is economic growth. There will be industrialization because Brazil has a fascinating token. Above and beyond 200 million people, young people and what have you, and samba and old stuff, Brazil's got natural resources. So Brazil sits at the very beginning of any industrial value chain. So you've got your iron, you've got your natural resources, and you build the next level of the value chain. So it's perfect. Germany can do that because we are sitting in the middle of nothing, so we need to find people who have got the natural resources where we can add technology and what have you. So I'm very optimistic about the country, but the government now needs to act first and put the plan in place, and then everything else will fall in place. So very optimistic, but start at the root cause and don't talk the, talk the actions to get there yet. I'd like to come back to the MOU, um, but first, uh, Rudolfo, um, this question, how can a new project uh, pipeline of, of high quality and resilient infrastructure be financed? Yeah, we are, <clears throat> we are an investors in infrastructure in Latin America with roughly six billion invested, six million dollars invested in Latin America. Uh, interestingly, we didn't start um, uh, in Brazil. We started actually in Chile 2006, and these assets we still own today. So as long-term investors, we're very comfortable with the asset class of infrastructure, and we, we buy to hold. Uh, then we expanded into Peru, into Mexico. We're very happy with infrastructure investments there. And last year we signed uh, the first investment in renewable energy in Brazil with the Votorantin Group uh, in a partnership. So, um, uh, but these have been, you know, this is just scratching the surface of what actually Latin America needs and Brazil needs for that matter. 
And I think typically what we think, you know, there are some countries that have done infrastructure development very well, just to pick one is Australia. And if you look at some of these countries, what they did well, they, they do three things well. First, they do, you know, they create a pipeline of scalable projects. And it's not just an initiative like for the next 12 months, we put a couple of projects together, put it on a marketing presentation, then you just sell it to the market. It's, it's the whole mindset of bringing together different ministries, you know, transportation, environment, finance, uh, and so forth, mining and energy, bring them all together behind a common agenda and create this pipeline of projects across different sectors, <clears throat> across different industries, and integrate the view and have one, one common goal of, you know, really making this the, the infrastructure pipeline uh, take off. And that has to be foreseeable. There has to be, you know, a, a, a time lapse for many, many years. Like Ideally, ten. exactly. Like Ideally ten. over more than one government. This cannot mm. be just a government or just a ministry. It has to be, you know, almost a conviction of the political class across political parties. So that's number one. Um, uh, number two is is actually the, these these assets have to be available in a, in a de risk uh, at least for us in a de risk fashion meaning they uh, cannot be greenfield anymore because that's where the high risk is and where we as financial investors have no capability of managing those projects typically that's a strategic company an operator uh, or even you know the government at the beginning because you have environmental licenses you have you know expropriation you have rights uh, so it's it's relatively complex and of course you have construction risk you have all sorts of risks that, that we as financial investors cannot manage so we typically invest in brownfields but relatively quickly you know a project after two three years becomes from greenfield brownfield and that's where we invest and we keep it for 20 30 40 years um, and there is a concept called asset recycling where you can actually bring in investors like us uh, after the initial development phase so we can stay for the long term. And the, the people who have developed, the companies who have developed those assets actually get the new money and develop the next ones. And then have a higher return because yes, they have a higher risk, of course. But that's a very nice concept on how you, you use different pools of capital for different phases of a project. And I think finally, and that's something that is also very relevant in our Latin American markets, which is a stable regulatory environment, which is, doesn't always <laughs> happen this way. So the regulatory environment has to, have, has to be no news. You know, it's stable, it doesn't change, it is in, with independent regulatory agencies and it's just constant over time. So these are the three factors that, you know, they are easy said but difficult to, to implement and to act on. But this is the, you know, the guiding, uh, the guiding uh, light that, that we need to see in countries to actually you know, de develop and, and take off in a, in a bigger fashion. And then to your initial question on the pipeline, you know, there's different sources for this pipeline. It can be privatizations, it can be new concessions, it can be you know, uh, private, uh, private to private, it can be asset sales by state-owned companies like we're seeing now in some of those bigger corporates like Petrobras. So there's, there's different sources. And then of course there's the greenfields, there's new developments. You know, without extending further, Chile is a country that has done very well in that area as well, just to take, pick one in, in Latin America. Just to give you an example how the private sector generates their own pipeline. In Chile, you have a system that we, we have a toll road company there, Grupo Costanera. They have an in-house uh, uh, area that develops new projects for toll roads that go proposed to the government, and the government is convinced they, they make a tender, an open tender, uh, so our company might not win, but if they don't win, they get compensated for the development costs of that project. So there is an incentive for private parties to actually propose, even though they might not win, to propose new, new infrastructure projects. Thank you. E, Mariana, how do you see this question? How can a new project pipeline of high quality and resilient infrastructure be financed? Yes, uh, I would definitely go to the sustainable part of it because uh, we do believe that it needs to be a it needs to be retrofitted, and yes, it needs to be financed to get in that front. But uh, our concern in the aviation industry is absolutely committed to the sustainable way that this is done. So we have been um, focusing on uh, creating commitments within the industry and, help, and supporting uh, both government and, uh, and industry collaborators and peers in order to, to make those uh, processes possible. And, uh, and bring the efficiency that we need to these processes. So if you look at, uh, you know, the infrastructure for aviation is usually focused on uh, obviously airports, which is something that we could see. But the, the huge piece of it is in uh, air traffic and control management systems that we need to implement. So 
you were talking about how you got here and you were stuck in traffic. But all of us as passengers also uh, face that on a flight. If you're out and up in the air and you can't land and you can see that the aircraft is going around and around, it is because of infrastructure. That is uh, the access, that is the inc our, our unwillingness and incapacity to land. And that has a re huge imp impact in your lives because it delays your uh, arrival time, but also in the environment and the sustainable development that we all, uh, we all want to break to our infrastructure process. So by uh, creating that efficiency, we will be able to actually have a cost-effective, uh, more cost-effective uh, airport, we'll be able to have a more energy efficient uh, infrastructure and also uh, greater well-being for everyone that it's using those infrastructures. So we're very focused on creating that sustainable development approach, but also focused on how uh, we are providing the better and uh, most equitable services to the clients and the passengers and ourselves at the end of the day. Thanks. Um, just to come back. Um, um, Georgina, you said that uh, that uh, investors, these big financial investors, are nervous about these markets. Um, I can think of a few reasons myself why they might be, but uh, why are they? What are the principal reasons that make them nervous? So, if you're you're well accustomed to investing in infrastructure across OECD markets, and you have no uh, resources to put out uh, into, into emerging markets. So you, you don't know uh, how to assess the credit risk. You don't know how to target returns. You don't know how to, to, uh, to, um, to assess, uh, to, to, to consider asset allocation. It's much easier to stay in the markets that you're familiar in. And you partner with someone like IFC, um, who is very familiar with these markets, that has people across all these markets, that has you know, boots on the ground, that, that, that understands, can explain the risk to you, and you can partner with them. We, are, we have our uh, money at risk too, so we are, we are sharing, or we look after their money as if it's our, their own. And we bring them along, alongside us and demonstrate that, that whether you're investing in Mozambique or Mongolia, or, or in Brazil, um, these are risks that we understand well, and, and, and by demonstration we can show how we go about it, and, and then hence bring in others behind. And, and to some of the points that my colleagues on the, on the panel were raising, you know, stability is incredibly important. And whether it's stability of the, of the government or stability of the institution that you're investing with, knowing that we have been facing the challenges of, of unstable governments, of, un, of, of unstable regulation that does occur in, in some of these markets, but that we have always been there. And, and we, we said to our, our, our investors, look, you're going to give us 100, uh, 500 a million, half a billion of your own money. Let's imagine if you'd invested it with us five years ago or two years ago, and we played out for them what kind of a portfolio they would have, have, have been invested in. Because the magic of, of the program that, that we have is you invest slithers of money in each of our project, project, projects. Um, so it's not that you put 200 million uh, at risk in one project and 300 in another, you're putting maybe 50 in a slew of projects across, uh, across in a portfolio, and you create a portfolio where, yes, one of these projects uh, may, may, uh, may uh, have an issue or two. It's, it, it does happen in infrastructure that things get delayed. Um, but if, if you have a, a portfolio of you know, 80 projects in 30 countries, your risk is obviously minimized, that portfolio approach. And you follow an investor that knows these markets, you can then feel much more comfortable about taking that risk. Um, one of my colleagues here uh, talked about Greenfield. or I mean, clearly it's much, much um, more, uh, le less scary to invest in a brownfield project where the, the, the asset is already performing. We, we invest in Greenfield. And to bring investors into Greenfield projects where that, that clearly that risk is much higher as you're building out the project, uh, that, that's, the, that's the area we, we, we are, is our strength. Um, and showing to, to institutional investors that understand this in, in other markets, but, but are, are concerned about emerging markets, uh, particularly with the sustainability. I mean, we have um, uh, performance standards that we stick to religiously. We look at the, the impact of the investment, and that gives uh, insurance companies, large investors that have a reputation, comfort that their money is not going to be at risk and they're not going to be on the headlines of, heaven forbid, the FT, you know. Um, <laughs> so so, so th people are comfortable Good working with... Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. no, 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 no but, yeah. <clears throat> so that, these are some of, the, some, of the reasons, some of the concerns that investors can have and, and some of the ways that IFC can mitigate those concerns. Rudolfo, what's your, your view on that? I mean, is, is 
no greenfield only in these markets, or is that a worldwide policy? Yeah, it's, uh, maybe it's a, it's a little bit more nuanced. So um, our companies or companies we invest in, they would invest, of course, in, in greenfield because they have a portfolio of projects. So if they have whatever five highways, they would invest in one or two of our three highways new. What we don't do because we don't have the capability and the skill is to actually invest full-fledged in a pure green field. At least not for now. Maybe that evolves over time, but for now our investment strategy is to actually focus on brown fields and to focus in exactly on that concept of asset recycling. So if someone develops a green field um, and needs you know, liquidity for the next green field, so we give these operators or corporates liquidity so they can actually sell the asset and go to develop the next green field, and we keep them the asset once it's become you know, uh, brownish, uh, less, less green. Uh, so in a way, it de -risk. So, So it's, it's nuanced. For instance, <coughs> With, uh, with Grupo Costa Rica and Chile, we, we constantly develop new, new uh, highway projects, but we have a portfolio of projects already with them. So develop it in-house, so it's part of their growth, uh, growth path. Um, so, so maybe that's, that's a little bit the difference there between green and brown. Uh, Joey, the, well, I, like, yeah. I like green and brown, I like them both, uh, because this is all about opportunity, all right? And I believe to de-risk de a bit the, the greenfield approach. I mean, is that there is, you know, there's going to be an alliance between uh, public and private partners. And um, I mean, if we, if, for example, you know, you, you go together with us and an off-taker, so you've got all it takes to be successful. There's someone who provides the money, there's someone who provides the capabilities, the technology to make it work. He, takes the operational risk, so to speak. And then there is an off-taker, typically the customer, or if it's energy or, or if it's oil or gas, there's somebody else. And they bring those three together. And that's uh, the best uh, of all worlds, which you can have because you have a capable strategic who knows how to execute. Either way, brownfield as well as uh, greenfield, you've got somebody you know, with the bringing the money and there is a regulatory body to make sure that the investment climate is somewhat comfortable and doesn't change every other year and there's a new government. And that brings it back to what I said earlier, there's got to be a plan, an economic development plan which goes over life cycle, not over period of when the next election is going to be. It's got to be life cycle, life cycle of energy, life cycle of infrastructure or whatever we are going to invest into. So I actually do believe that Latin America, Brazil, you mentioned Chile, which is probably uh, quite ahead of, uh, of the crowd here. Argentina, I mean, we'll see the jury is half in, half out. I mean, Marco did an excellent job, but we'll see how it, how it develops. And Brazil is in, in the beginning, I believe, of a new era. After years of stagnation, it could well now take off by such things with public-private partnership. I've met many, many people the last couple of days, private equity people, uh, even state-owned companies who have a very, very clear approach of what needs to be done if they only, if they only let them, <laughs> you know, to get this, the job done. So I'm, I have to say I'm very comfortable with the capabilities and the spirit and the power of this country. It is truly that there is a lack of uh, vision a lack of uh, long-term plan which needs to be put in place and everything else I guarantee you people will come. We, we are here for 150 years uh, and uh, don't intend to, to leave and uh, just yesterday I said we are going to invest another 5 billion rei uh, in the next few years to help uh, build the infrastructure but it's also about small and medium enterprises you know to build them up to bring small and medium enterprises to the country. Uh, so that we have a broad-based economic development, not just a few Petrobras and Embraer and, and, and what have you. Uh, and and that needs to have a plan, and I, I tell you, everyone will come isn't to invest. Problem, sorry, Joe, isn't the problem also, though, that what you do have these plans, but then they keep changing, right? So, like, like you mentioned, um, I think electricity, uh, the electricity law or whatever has changed, changes every four years or something, which is difficult for... But see, the, 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 good, the, good, the good thing is that our customers don't change every time. And, uh, and, there is, uh, and people don't change, you know. Just, you've got to have sustainable, reliable, affordable 
electrical power. It gets pretty dark at night if you don't. <laughs> and, uh, and, and if you, you know, how, how, how would anyone, anyone invest into automation? Everyone talks about the Internet of Things, and uh, it's all crap. I mean, if you don't have electrical power and reliable um, logistics, just don't even think about that anyone invests into automation and, uh, and the Internet of Things if you can do a factory run your factory in a, in a meaningful way. So, uh, I mean, you just need to face reality, and our customers do face reality. And we all do respect also on the economic uh, power um, policy. I mean, Brazil has been having renewable energy when the whole world didn't even know about what this really is, which is hydro. And the good thing about hydro is it goes day and night because the water flows even if the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. So they have quite a good starting point. The issue now is climate changes. Although some people believe it's been made up by the Chinese, it's real. It's real. And that also even now affects the water flow and you know the quantities. And uh, this very last year, we needed to help uh, the country here with uh, fast track power gen for cell power chain because they didn't get the energy because the water wasn't there. Um, so there is quite a good base to build on, a good brownfield base to build on, but then the returns and the attractiveness of investing comes with um, efficiency. What you, what you say, asset, uh, asset, asset management. management. And so there is, again, there is, uh, there is all it takes here. Uh, we just need to bring people together and make it work and execute and not talk so much about what should have been done and could be done and wasn't done. And the bottlenecks that you're uh, going to be clearing with this MOU, what are those? Well, time will tell. I believe uh, I, uh, I said yesterday publicly, I said, look, uh, get your government done in, in October. November, it's time for I hope it doesn't take that long in Germany did. But, um, but um, and then let's go sit together and do a B2G or maybe a G2G and come with a 20 gigawatt plan. Come with a 5,000 kilometer of grid optimization plan. Come with a 10,000 kilometers of roads and, and, uh, and an urban mobility management. I mean, Look at this great city. It's all great except the traffic. It's a disaster. I mean, a real disaster. And uh, so things need to be done, and they can be done. It's not rocket science to put a few, you know, a few uh, uh, rail cars on the ground and, and make uh, traffic work, and uh, and also then contain contain the root causes of inflation. I mean, you can you can raise interest rates till we are everyone is blue in the face. Uh, all you do is you kill your economy if the root cause of inflation is inefficient operations. If agriculture is inefficient uh, and, it, you know, and, and the, the goods and, and, and groceries doesn't, don't make it to the, to, the, to the customer, the consumer, there is inflation. And if 30% are rotting between you know, the, the, the west of Brazil and Sao Paulo, and it's got nothing, that inflation's got nothing to do with uh, interest rates. It is about efficiency. So the, 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 the challenges we see in this country is, not, is no rocket science to be solved. Yeah. It's a convergent approach to get it done. And there is, as I said, enough money, right? Who looks, who so looks I, for I, I wanted to, to, to ask you where the money is coming from, because I think it's, it's, it's very important to consider the, the, you know, the, the uh, fund of money that the government may have, and it has a responsibility to use that money as it sees to best serve its population. And it's maybe easy from the outside to say, these are the issues that need to be solved, and here is the plan, and go get, get on with it. But they have to rationalize the finance. And it's to, to over-indebt the government, I think, is a... Is a uh... I, would, uh, I would not expect the government, the government to finance everything and solve the problem of the private sector. Uh, absolutely not. All I'm saying is there's got to be a framework over life cycle so that uh, the private sector uh, you know, finds it attractive to invest. I'd be happy to put a billion euro to work tomorrow you know, if I had a roadmap to get it done. And I'm sure I find another billion equity in any insurance company anywhere in the world. Hmm. And then there are a few, you, know, you leverage it up, so you have a 10 billion thing to get started with. 
but there's got to be some, you know, an infrastructure uh, in, in the framework which, uh, you know, enables people to put their money to work. That's all yeah. we ask for. But it's not about getting the job done on operations. It's just about set the framework and let the private sector do the job as it does everywhere in the world. Yeah, there, there is almost all of these sectors are profitable in themselves, unless we go into not some marginal, you know, solar energy that is still on the on the brinks of becoming profitable. But you know, renewable energy. We just inv invested in in, um, in um, wind park farms, wind parks. Uh, you know, all airports, ports. Good highways. idea. Very so, good idea. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hugely profitable. Um, you know, there is enough capital. If we just take institutional investors' money and, and sovereign wealth funds, it's seven trillion of investments. And you know, of course, they are mostly government bonds, but they are very open to equity and they're very open to long term. We have a special fund. We have a very long term horizon. You know, our pension fund, that is our uh, limited partner in a way, the only investor we have is still on a surplus. So we are still getting money to invest and we have to reinvest our returns. So uh, we're not looking for liquidity in many of our investments. So we have this long-term horizon. So, but, but it's not so much a matter of, you know, of, of, of capital available. It's much more uh, the availability of projects. You know, where you, have, where you have this plan, as you mentioned, you have the pipeline, you have you know, a stable regulatory environment, and then you have you know, the, the mix of put it in greenfield and brownfield so that you can actually feel comfortable to invest for the long term. If you really look at, at economies which have been you know, accelerating and expelling, <coughs> the common ground is they had a plan to develop the infrastructure of their country. They said, we're going to put 10 gigawatt to work over five years, right? And then they went into auctions. So how about just, you know, the two of us go together and say five gigawatts in the northeast of Brazil, three cent per kilowatt hour power out, and then talk to the government and say, our in or you're out? That's the type of stuff you put uh, the potato on the fork, as we say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you need to be specific and clear and precise and not just try to save the world by talking. Isn't the problem here in Brazil, though, I mean, Brazil has had plans. I mean had the, uh, I almost forget the name of it now, the acceleration, growth acceleration plan from Dilma. Um, but then they, they change and then there's another problem which is uh, the elephant that's actually, the elephant in the room that's actually not here, which is BNDS, uh, which for a long time was financing um, uh, Brazil's infrastructure. You have a lack of long-term finance in Brazil, long-term finance op options. Now, inflation's low at the moment, but it could be a cyclical low, it could come up and back up again. So. How do you solve that sort of problem? I don't know, Rodolfo, perhaps, since you're investing yeah, I in think, I think, you know, that the BNDS has been in the past uh, sort of uh, scrawled out the pr private sector. Um, but it is, there is now the belief that the BNDS should be more uh, long-term financier by market rates. And if anything, you know, not invest necessarily the big champions that can find alternative international debt markets or capital markets anyway, but more the ones that are more the bottlenecks that could be, you know, basic greenfield infrastructure, could be, you know, frontier technologies, could be small and medium sized enterprises that are going to long term financing. So, but that's a different vision of what, uh, you know, uh, it could be very well oriented on how Germany was reconstructed after the Second World War. There were, there were some very good initiatives there. So, but, but, but I think that the long-term finance has to actually come from in, in international investors. Absolutely. So, so Absolutely. that is institutional. And don't, the seven trillion doesn't even account for insurance companies, you know, for what banks can be put to work, what private equity firms can put to work. So this huge amount of capital that is the long term. And still, you know, you can develop the capital markets, the infrastructure, the ventures is one example that has sort of slowly taken off, but it has potential as well. And then the government doesn't need, even need to put money or capital to work, just a little incentives on the tax side, and that, that, could, be, that could be even enough to kickstart the process. And the off-taking. Some, you, you've got to be sure about the off-taking. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that's, I think that's important to close the loop, but um, there have been thousands of examples all over the world and Latin America, too, how that works. It's no rocket science. 
But you also need to be uh, assured of the, the strength of the local financial system. So uh, Peru has been working on this for the last uh, 15, 20 years of, of, of ensuring and setting up the, 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 the legal system such that foreign investors are treated the same as local investors, that they have access to the same tax regime. And that has enabled, I know there's 30 projects recently done in, in the transport sector because uh, investors understood that they would be treated, the foreign investors felt that they would be treated exactly the same as the local investors. And it's important not only to have your plan and to have a, a and to have projects, but to have a, a legal system and a financial sector that is empowering to uh, foreign investors. So we are back to having a plan, right? <laughs> I, I think we need to move away from just just having just having a plan and thinking about um, because if if having a plan uh, was was all that was needed to bring in institutional investors. I think we would have solved the problem by now. Uh, so it's also the regulatory regime of the institutional investors. So my experience is working with the, with the French and the German investors, and there, the the local regulations that that, that, that the insurance companies have to manage manage under require investments such as the one I was describing to be investment grade. And most of the most of the investments in emerging markets are not investment grade, and so you have to bridge that gap. Yeah. So there are, there are there are other issues beyond. But doesn't but doesn't the, but doesn't, <laughs> the, but doesn't the plan include on how you run your country, in terms of uh, you know the legal system, provide comfort to investors that say whatever you do here, you're legally safe. There's an international way of dealing with dispute, and that's what I mean is a plan. I don't talk about energy plan or infrastructure, but it's a plan how to develop your country above and beyond the four-year cycle of, you know, election. And there are many examples to that. And uh, you know, all I can say, build that plan and they will come. They've always come. So uh, on our sector, in our industry, we, we actually have plans. And uh, if you look at the ICAO, um, the United Nations Organizations for Civil Aviation, we are looking at that and you know, infrastructure is a huge base of what we do because infrastructure, it will actually be the base for any development in technology and innovation and we are a technology uh, driven industry. So um, ICAO has actually been advocating dramatically for, for PPPs uh, on, uh, for the sector and you know, in bringing governments and the industry together in order to do that and obviously financial organizations that are going to be able to, to give that support and provide the, the mechanisms. And in Brazil, if you look at the Brazilian uh, scenario and reality, we are obviously uh, a company that are producing uh, regional aircraft and we are advocating for uh, regional integration. But even within Brazil, if you look at the number of airports for the size of our economy, for the size, uh, the size of demographics and even uh, the, the distance between the regions, we, we need lots more airports. So uh, the, the truth is that if you compare the Brazilian uh, reality with the others, even in, within the region, you see this, uh, it's not a very good reality for the size that we have and the number of airports that we can provide. So there's great room, there's a huge need, and uh, the, the stakeholders in these sectors are actually talking and advocating for it. But yes, the plan is there. We're still up to execute it. I just wonder if there's, um, a, I want to come back to the environment as well, Mariana, because I think that that's a key thing in Brazil. Um, you know, being the guardian of the Amazon, the Mata Atlantica, these forests. Um, but I just wonder if there's anyone in the audience, because I know there's a, quite a few infrastructure uh, experts here who wants to make a comment. Um, there's Paulo. Paulo here in the front. It's just a question, Paulo Sotero from the Brazil Institute at the Wilson Center. Uh, we hear a lot of, we read a lot of news about Chinese investments in infrastructure in Brazil. I believe that they are mostly concentrated in the electric sector. What do the Chinese don't know that you do, or vice versa? Is I wanted to, your expert opinion about the significance of there, this move by China that was before completely buying things here, but now they are seem to have a more important presence in being old players in this space in Brazil. Help us understand what the Chinese are doing. So, to my mind, it's about risk appetite. Uh, it's about risk appetite. So, they come from an emerging market. They understand emerging markets and they have a risk appetite that is different to other investors. And they, have, they are able to put large sums of money to work. And they understand that the investments that they make here can make them a return that is, that is commensurate with the risk because they understand the risk. 
And so that's, but they have a large, large amount. I mean, so the program that I was describing was actually begun by a $3 billion investment that, a uh, $3 billion allocation that PBOC, Public Bank of, uh, People, People's Bank of China, made to IFC, and they did the same for uh, um, Inter-American Development Bank and EBRD and others. They allocated $3 billion, and we created our platform in order to enable them to, to, to learn from IFC. But that was an enormous allocation, so they have a lot of money uh, with which they can work, and they have a risk appetite that is commensurate with what, how they, they see the risk. That, that would be my opinion. I don't know about mine. Well, I'm happy, above and beyond financial capabilities, understanding markets better. There could also be a strategic interest. Right? <clears throat> um, and I would actually put the investment of China into Brazil and Africa more into the strategic category of a global view of things. And I mean, Brazil and, uh, and Africa are developing economies, unlike Australia. So in order to, you know, to avoid and there's debates with a developed economy like Australia. You know, if you're China, you would rather go to areas where you can bring a lot of money and get your strategic interest in return. That's what you would do. The Chinese are, are, are very smart. They're very long-term oriented. They don't talk so much. And if they do, they think first and then act <clears throat> and uh, they have a plan. And that plan is not by the quarter. That plan is not by the year, not by the decade. That plan is about a long view of things. And if you talk to Chinese companies and, and, and uh, leaders, they say, look, you know, the last 200 years has just been a minor deterioration of uh, long-term development, which we need to correct. And if you're try to think about this a little bit, I think we understand why they've been trying to invest uh, so much into agriculture, into natural resources. They don't invest into other things. Those, those are the two areas where they do. And that's actually not that big of a risk because government to government is about strategic interest. So um, we need to especially financial investors, need to have a more short-term view about returns than they have. And that's why I, and the strategics like us are somewhat in the middle. And that's why I believe um, we better also think about this together with those countries uh, where strategic investors invest into, because at some point in time you may not want to be uh, caught flat-footed with a single option. <laughs> just compliment us. I think we have um, um, different type of Chinese investors, of course. Um, uh, there's the strategic, you know, like you've seen in Brazil with uh, Southern Grid, the Three Georges. We have seen in Chile, we have uh, uh, seen China Southern Grid. So, and State Grid here and Southern Grid in Chile. Uh, but there's also the institutional investors in China that have been investing abroad. Um, and there, I would say, are more like-minded, like, -minded, like institu international institutional investors that are also long-term. And I think what we still need to learn how to work is with the Chinese SOEs, uh, because they're strategic, they are uh, long-term, uh, as, as was said here. Uh, but we don't think, even for us, we don't think we know yet how to team up well with them. And we're learning that even as long-term investors, how to work together, because it's a new reality. And you might say, well, if a CPFL is sold to a Chinese, it's just a Chinese company. But sometimes we share control, like in the case of the Chilean company now where we have invested. And it's a learning process for us as well as institutional investors to learn how to, how to work with them. And, and I would concur, um, um, very patient, very, very uh, industrious and laborious in terms of learning the industry and, and not being uh, too quick to come to, to conclusions or to, to jump to conclusions and, and take decisions. So it's a longer term learning process that they're doing. And I would even say, it might have a financial interest, but it looks like, at least in Latin America, most of that is really long-term strategic interest rather than just uh, financial results. Maria. Just on our side, uh, Paula, the, actually, if you look at China, there are great opportunities to my previous point as well. So they, there is a huge opportunity there to grow. 
and uh, China is actually investing both in infrastructure with the characteristics that my previous colleagues just mentioned. So they, they're focused on the long term. This is an industry that works with the huge cycles. So you're talking about 15, 20 year cycles. And, uh, but also in the production and industrialization process, they're also investing in, and they have the means and they have the, the plan and they're entering the market. So uh, we are, we're looking at that carefully. I think, uh, Susan, you have, you have a comment you'd like to make over here in the front. I just wanted to uh, thank you very much. This has been a really interesting panel. Um, and and you've, you've talked quite a lot about the different... You know, so I should, I should have asked you to introduce Susan yourself. Susan Gray from S&P Global. Um, you've talked a lot about the institutional, financial, regulatory frameworks that are important. Could you um, please just comment on governance and how you um, are looking to set the governance standards of counterparties that you're dealing with and how you're looking to, if you like, improve those governance and transparency standards over time, please. So from the IFC perspective, that's very core to the way that we invest. Uh, we have standards for, for the, the environment, social aspects and the governance of any project that we look at. Um, and But it, it, it's always a journey. As long as you are, you know when you look someone in the eye and you're working with them, that you un they understand what you are trying to achieve, whether they're there on day one or they're going to be there in a year's time. You can work with them to implement uh, the best standards in, in corporate governance. Um, and, and certainly from, from the IFC perspective as an international development institution, it's integral to what we do in that the projects have the highest standards. But we recognize that they are not necessarily in place at the moment we invest, but that but they will be within a short time. We bring those standards to our investee companies. Yeah, for, for us it's key, I think, in, in, in that same sense is, you know, it's, a, it's compliance, it's one foremost, it's almost a, a, a gating item um, that's, that's not negotiable. Governance, you negotiate, but I think there is some compliance aspects of the environment that is not, there's no negotiation. It's either there or not. You can, of course, evolve, but it has, it's, it's a core due diligence aspect of any investments that is even short, medium, or long term. Uh, that we actually are comfortable with how compliance is managed, how transparency is done. It's, it's, it goes as long as, as, as far as, you know, business culture, values, etc. So that has to be in place. It can, of course, be developed and adjusted. I think, you know, compliance in Brazil is not that old uh, concept. So, uh, you know, the last years have brought that to every, to every boardroom, to every executive suite. You know, there is a lots of advisors now advising on compliance. So it has... It's, uh, but it's, it, there is a big, big openness to improve that and to develop that. But the core, the core values have to be in place. I think then you can formalize it and, uh, in terms of compliance. And on, on, on governance side, it's key as well. So I think the governments, you know, um, the independence of, of boards, uh, the qualification of boards. So there, there's a whole set of criteria that we apply in our investments. And I think that's part of our value addition as well to our investments is to bring this institutionalization. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to invested companies. I just wonder, is it hard to attract money to Brazil now, given Lava Jato and just about every construction company of a certain size seem to have had something to do with that? So how, how do you convince people to invest here now? Um, you know, I, we, we are constantly working internally to, to, to explain what is happening in Brazil and to see the medium and long term. And actually, my... Uh, our view is, is not just mine, is that uh, Brazil has improved. You know, if you think five or ten years ago, it was looking good at the surface, and it was totally rotten inside. Um, maybe I'm exaggerating to make the point. Now I think we've just seen how rotten it was, and it's being addressed. So the patient, in a way, you t we're taking out the, 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 the cancer, and it's taking time, will take time for the patient to cure as well, but at least we're addressing, we're seeing we're seeing, I don't know if we're seeing the whole problem, but we're seeing part of the problem and we see, we're addressing it as a country. What is core through institutions, so not through a central politburo or some central decision maker, it's institutions, independent institutions, working to improve the process. And that's, that's the most important thing. So, you know, you could make good investments 10 years ago, but you were not really clear what was behind that. I think it's much clearer now. There's more transparency, there's more consciousness on what's really happening in this company. So, so that, that trend, of course, is just a start. It's, it's a long journey. And it's not just for Brazil, it's Latin America as a whole. And you know, I'm not qualified enough to talk about other emerging markets, but certainly there as well. So, but, but certainly for Brazil, this is a journey that has started and it started into the, in the right direction. 
you, Mariana, uh, just on the compliance still, there's a lot of uh, talk about environmental licenses being really hard in Brazil, but also that it sometimes don't seem very effective because you, you still get the environmental damage that comes from projects. So what, what can be done about that? Yeah, I think that, you know, we, the compliance matter is something that it's here to stay. So we're, we're just going to have to deal with that. And I think it's a good thing for every company, for every government, for, for every industry. And we as an industry that do have a lot of uh, commitment to, to this have actually been advocating under the World Economic Forum that regard. When it goes to the environment, uh, we are an industry that are focused on the environment. We're really committed. We actually have a formal commitment to reducing climate change. So uh, we, we don't do this on a Brazil basis or an Embraer basis. It's not a company one. It's a global effort because this, this it, the whole point that we're trying to make as an industry is that we can't have this individual. We can't have systems to take place individually we can, or regionally even. We, we are a global industry with global impact and, and, and capacity. So we need, a glo we need global process to be implemented in the environmental and, and sustainable development site, even in infrastructure. So for, for instance, when you talk about uh, the commitment, the formal commitment that we have to reduce climate change, you're talking about uh, an industry that it said that by 2050, it's going to reduce 50% of its CO2 emissions with the baseline of 2005. How are you going to do that? You're going to do that through a four pillar strategy. And that is technology, which is, you know, for us as a, an OEM, it's the, the highest investments that we make because we're talking about billions of dollars that are uh, being uh, deployed to, to build a new aircraft. But if you, if you go forward to the other stakeholders of the industry, you get into logistics and then you get into infrastructure and you get into the market-based measure, which is a different thing that entangles an offsetting uh, carbon trade program to, to actually achieve those goals. But infrastructure it has to be the core, and all of this involves the environmental and the governance and eventually the, all the compliance matters, yes. I think we've got a couple of more questions um, just here in the middle. If you could introduce yourself. Hi, uh, <clears throat> Flavio Cardoso with American Tower. I was wondering if the panel could comment a little bit on the telecom information, communications infrastructure, state of, and reviews on how to bridge some of the, the gaps there. It's not very familiar with anyone. <laughs> Would you like to comment? <laughs> I, could actually, I could actually comment then. We have a we, we actually have a project to 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 um, with the Brazilian government, uh, Embraer and Telebras partnered to uh, build a satellite, and we were on the path of you know launching it formally, but it's already started. We had the first uh, launch in the French Guiana last year, and uh, it's not my scope of activity, but uh, it's a, a, def a project within the defense organization, and it's with, with that purpose. It has a civilian purpose. It's, it's, it's a it's strategic pro project for the Brazilian government, obviously for Embraer, and uh, it's under Visiona, which is a, a, one of our subsidiaries. Maybe I will comment a little bit just since yeah, you sure. asked. Uh, it should be part of the plan, I guess, as part of the, the comment. Uh, there is a significant underinvestment. Uh, if, you, if you look at, relatively speaking, all these infrastructures will depend on you know, communication, telecommunications, all the technologies that you know, will connect things and bring efficiencies, productivities, et cetera. I think there is a gap in the vision, and typically it's not discussed enough uh, it's left to some companies and uh, significantly taxed, but not part of this uh, more uh, over all encompassing plan of uh, the long term vision. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, infrastructure is also about connectivity and all that great stuff with Internet of Things and Force Industrial Revolution and all that stuff, not going to work if you don't have connectivity. 4G looks good here, but um, maybe it doesn't look that great if you leave the suburban environment and there's no autonomous driving without connectivity. There's no autonomous driving in Sao Paulo anyway because you <laughs> are in, in traffic. Be line, <laughs> traffic chain, traffic chain all the time, but uh, absolutely agree with you. Uh, 
connectivity matters a lot, but otherwise there is no progress on, on uh, you know, exchanging information and optimize things. And you just signed a digital, digital alliance as well? Siemens signed a digital course. alliance with ICC? What of, course, we, of course we have, because we can contribute a lot on that one. And uh, the way we do it is not talk so much about how great software and cyberspace is, the way we look at it is that we connect the physical world with the virtual world. And that's what many people forget at times if they talk about next generation of manufacturing and engineering, next generation of industrialization. Many people, some people try to make us believe there is no physical world anymore, there is no hardware, there is no molecules, it's all cyber. Uh, thanks God, the fact of the matter is there is physical world, there is woods and plastic and chocolate and cars and carpets and clothes and what have you. Hopefully also humans. <laughs> so uh, connecting the physical world with the capabilities of simulation and uh, analytics and bring that knowledge which we generate up there in the physical, in the virtual world back into the physical process, that's the recipe and you know, make the physical world more efficient, resource efficient, faster, uh, by connecting the data, understand what they mean, and bring them back into the physical processes of whatever that is, flying aircraft or, or connecting people or, or anything of that. And that's uh, what we, I think we figured out uh, over time, and that's been the recipe by we actually, almost every quarter when we report our numbers in the digital factory, the gap actually increases between us and the next in line. And we work really hard to continue that way. It's not that simple as it looks like. And it's by no means arrogant because it's really hard to con convince the customers also to let the data flow and bring them back into the physical world. But um, yeah, we did that and we, what you also said we would do is we actually bring that automation to universities, to students, learn those young people on how, what that actually is all about. <laughs> and that, you know, learning the physical world is not out of fashion. It actually becomes more in fashion as we speak because the physical world will be a better world supported by and enabled by the virtual world, not the other way around. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, you need to talk to, to young people about, uh, train them in uh, man-machine interfaces, in what, you know, automation is all about and not that dirty work and oily, greasy stuff anymore. You know, you work with your brain and your hands together. And so that's uh, very important to us and um, that's why we said we invest a lot also into education and training. Uh, those young people and get them off the street and show them a way and future and make them buy into it that this is something which is good for them because if we don't get the society to buy into the next generation of industrialization there will be a revolution <laughs> that's going to be on the street with burning cars and not self-driving cars because digitalization splits society and the last thing you want to split it even further as we have split it already so we need to integrate it. And so that comes back to infrastructure and societal responsibility more than any other talk about how great we are in connectivity and, and cyberspace. People don't understand that. If people don't understand what you're talking about, they are scared and they don't believe you. And they don't want to change anything because they say, where I mean, today is safe, at least not as, you know, could be worse. And that's what we need to overcome also as a societal barrier and then we can make it work. Technology is not the holdup. The acceptance of society going forward and giving people a perspective, that's what we have at stake and that's what we need to do together also as part of a plan of a government of society, of economic and political and societal leaders like, like science and universities. I think that's what we really have at stake here. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> We had a couple of questions here, but I think we've, we've run out of time, so I apologise for that. But um, uh, I, just to sum up quickly, uh, Georgina told us about your program to bring in uh, these big institutional investors into emerging markets uh, and create confidence. 
Um, I think Joe you spoke a lot about the need for a plan. If I'm, um, economic development plan now. Economic development plan, a consistent. The rest will take care of. The rest will sort of follow. Uh, Rodolfo, um, that one of my takeaways from what you said is that the, these plans, they need to endure across governments. And I think the regulatory regimes, somehow you have to convince every new government that comes in to respect what's there and not change it too much. And uh, Mariana, I think you, um, you spoke a lot about what the airline industry is doing as well to try to, to make infrastructure more sustainable. So with that, I'd like to thank you uh, very much. Can uh, I just say one last thing? Because sure. I, I didn't realize this. So before there was a plan, IFC, our very first investment ever was in Brazil in a project in Siemens 61 years ago. So we did it together then. <laughs> <laughs>